Aloha. Thanks so much for joining us on Think Tech Hawaii. Time for responsible change. And today we're going to talk about what's the big deal about diversity? Why, why is it important and why is there so much controversy and conflict over it? With David Larson, professor at Mitchell Hamlin School of Law and recent past chair of the American Bar Association Section of Dispute Resolution, and Rebecca Ratliff, who's had many years dealing with the executive level of the insurance claims industry and is herself a leading national and international mediation arbit mediator, arbitrator, and presenter and speaker on those topics. So let's start from the beginning. In the recent U.S. Supreme Court case in which they essentially threw out remedial affirmative action for 200 years of history of racial discrimination in educational institutions. One of the things that became an issue was the original affirmative action decision, Baki, rejected a number of the theories of what could constitute a compelling state interest that could be constitutionally protected and legally protected to try and remedy that historical inequity and inequity. And Justice Lewis Powell in a concurring, but what turned out to eventually be the accepted guiding theory for the case, said, okay, but diversity is a legitimate compelling state interest for a learning environment and learning institution. And we can treat it as such for purpose of its constitutional and legal protections. Justice Roberts, in throwing out affirmative action, rejected diversity not because it's a legit, not a legitimate state interest or a learning environment interest, but because it's not judicially measurable in his view, which may just mean that he and some of his colleagues don't understand it well enough to be able to determine whether educational institutions are implementing it or not. Okay, with that preface, David, where are we on diversity? What's your understanding of the diversity that is at issue and needs to be protected here? Yeah, I'll just mention that, um, as Chuck just explained, that up until this recent Supreme Court decision, the Supreme Court after Bakke was willing to accept the idea that diversity is a compelling compelling governmental interest. The 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 fair the students for fair admissions case that was just decided doesn't get rid of get, doesn't get rid of remedial affirmative action. The the only justification for affirmative action in employment has been a manifest imbalance in a traditionally segregated job category. It's only been you can only justify affirmative action in employment when it's remedial. That avenue is still available for schools. You can have affirmative action if you're going to point to a remedial cause, a remedial explanation, um, you follow the same precedent they do in employment. You would have to demonstrate this manifest imbalance in a traditionally segregated category. But for a lot of schools, I think they could do that. So, you know, I don't think that's really been discussed or explored yet, that parallel to employment, but that's still there. Um, the thing about education was that it not only had that possibility, which is a little more distasteful for the institution because the fact is you got to admit that you've got a bad past. You got to go back in and look at your own discrimination and fess up. I would much rather justify it for reasons forward looking like diversity. So nobody was going there to the former one saying that, yeah, I'm going to justify it because I've really been bad in the past. They would say, I'm going to justify it because I, I really believe in the benefits of diversity. So, um, but now that's been taken away. Uh, is the workplace different than an educational institution such that we should have two acceptable uh, 
reasons for affirmative action, yeah, I think you can make a pretty strong case that yes, it is different, that uh, young people will be assuming leadership roles um, when they graduate from college, that it'll be their world. We're, we're, we won't be here <laughs> uh, eventually, hopefully for a little while still, but um, you know, look at the United States and our demographics has changed pretty significantly. In Minnesota, for instance, our demographics have changed pretty dramatically in terms of um, in terms of different races and ethnicity. So people coming out of college have to be able to work in a multicultural, multi-ethnic, multiracial environment. And the earlier you get started doing that, the earlier you become comfortable doing that, I think the better off we all will be. So uh, to me, that's one of the values of diversity. The fact that we will continue to live in an increasingly diverse world. Um, where do you learn the skills to do it? Well, hopefully at home, in your family, but not always. And isn't an educational institution a good place to do it? Um, so, so yeah, I, I think that's a great justification. Yeah, you took words out of my mouth, um, David, although uh, you were much more thorough and eloquent. <laughs> um, I, yeah, as you were speaking, I was thinking, um, how important it is, you know, we know that not everyone will go to college, but certainly everyone should have the opportunity in the United States to go to college. And when there is a diverse environment in college, um, it, it is a training ground for how students, future working adults will thrive uh, or not in in their professional environments. Um, and so what, what we've said, what we've heard, I didn't make this quote up, but diversity is a fact. Um, we are different as people. Um, I was, had a conversation recently with someone who, um, who her dissertation was on uh, culture and race. And what her research turned up is that race is a social construct. There really is no such thing as race, but, but only really culture. Um, and race is something that was created really to divide. Um, and, and so, you know, here we are all, you know, different hues and different experiences, and different skill sets, different family orientations, um, different, um, d differently abled, uh, people, and we all have value. And because that's a fact, when we're together, uh, those different perspectives and those different experiences, whether it's in a college, uh, on a college campus, or in a work environment certainly makes the um, the experiences uh, more rich and um, enables really um, well and in in the work world profitability research has, has shown that um, but certainly a, a richer experience in um, community and the at the collegiate level. So is that a potential avenue as well that? instead of focusing on this artificial construct of race, you look at some other non-academic factors, culture, socioeconomic background, other attributes of the nature of the environment, the history of the applicant, of the potential student, in an effort to create as heterogeneous, as diverse a learning environment, human learning environment as possible. I think you're always well advised to be creative when it comes to uh, thinking about what could be a possible compelling government, governmental interest for, for going forward with affirmative action. But, but I do want to make the observation that um, this U.S. Supreme Court decision did not completely close the door on affirmative action. Um, basically, what it did, it it narrowed the kind of the uh, the window for for having affirmative action, and and I think the takeaway from it is that people can talk about race, and people can talk applicants to college can talk about race and talk about how race affected their life and what challenges it presented, and that's perfectly fine according to Roberts, so long as it's from an individual perspective. It's like this is how it affected me, and these are the qualities that grew in me um, and matured in me because of some of these challenges. Um, and, a, and an admissions committee can look at that and 
when they look at that, they are unavoidably considering race, not in terms of just um, kind of a stereotypical assumption that if you're a certain race, we're going to give you a certain number of points in our admission and, and we're going to give you a cumulative score and this will get you over the, over the line. But, but it's, it's just a much more uh, focused, particularized kind of inquiry. So race can still be part of the admissions process, but it has to be more of an individual inquiry. And, uh, and there's nothing to stop a, an institution from framing those questions to say to the applicants who, for, I don't know why they know, they wouldn't know what they need to write in their essay to make sure that they don't fall askew of this US Supreme Court decision. So you ask the question. So you ask somebody, you know, what challenges have you seen in your life that, that motivated you, that changed you, that matured you? And they conclude things like economic challenges, geographic challenges, um, and race. And there's no problem with asking that question and asking people to answer in a very individualized way. And I think that fits well within that, that exception that Roberts has. I really appreciate that point. Um, David made that point in an earlier conversation today about how um, applications can um, frame a question in a certain way that is compliant with the, the decision uh, from the Supreme Court, but can uh, basically open the door for opportunities for applicants to, to state as an individual uh, what challenges um, and what experiences they had um, that, that may have to do with, with race. And um, it's, it's important that um, I, I, it w I would like for you, um, David, if you could, to just briefly mention um, Justice Roberts' decision uh, or his um, his letter, the, the letter, the statement, the statement um, that he makes that actually is the window for the point that you're making here about how um, universities sh should admissions offices can. Um, be in compliance by asking, framing a question a certain way to to give um, applicants an opportunity to 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 make a to make a statement or personal statement. <laughs> You're looking up on the spot. Whatever you could do is to speak, so I I could find it quickly. I could read it to you, but let's see. Okay. At the this is what Robert says at the end of the majority opinion. At the same time, as all parties agree, nothing in this opinion should be construed as prohibiting universities from considering an applicant's discussion of how race affected his or her life, be it through discrimination, inspiration, or otherwise. So that's, I mean, uh, that's kind of an irrebuttable window there. It's, a, it's an invitation that, that universities can consider so long as it's somebody talking about how their race affected their lives. So here's a question that comes up. We know that Blum is out there with his millions or billions of dollars uh, hunting down people who will agree to be paid plaintiffs in claims against actions that are essentially intended to be remedial for hundreds of years of history of racially discriminatory employment, educational admissions, healthcare, housing, and, and other areas. Is the approach that you talked about an effective resistance against that kind of attack of disparate impact that is excluding brilliant Asian Americans or brilliant white Americans or whatever? Well, you know, I always thought that affirmative action was a was kind of a misnomer. That really, it's and the reason we have this process is because it's, as you mentioned, Chuck, it's it's remedial. I mean, it's because of you know we're trying to make up for discriminatory history, and so it's not affirmative in the sense that um, you're getting something uh, as an advantage that out of the blue. It's like yeah, it's not a bonus. Um, it's really, it's really being um, generated by the by the recognition that certain groups have suffered from discrimination in the past, and it's really incumbent on us to 
to to make up for that to do better so um you know i think when some of these groups are being so aggressive about condemning affirmative action one thing we should do is step back and say well wait a minute is it really a quote affirmative action or is it something else is it really more along the lines of a remedial action and let's think about our nation and our history and the reason why this really we really need to do this rebecca your thoughts agreed um yeah it's a way to to really right a wrong and to uh address accessibility or uh path inaccessibility you know and um you know there's other things we can do uh in spite of this decision there's nothing in this decision that prohibits you from doing extended outreach you know and going to recruit students in areas maybe you never recruited students before um so one thing you can do is kind of increase your applicant pool expand your applicant pool you know increase your increase your your recruiting by uh, outreach maybe set up some pathway programs um uh where you where you identify potential at a relatively early point and try and give some mentoring um at the conclusion of that pathway program then that person applies like anybody else but they're much more well positioned than they were before and they're going to be able to compete more successfully so that's that's something else we we can continue to do and i don't think we have any problem with the uh, students for fair admissions case one one of the things that we brought up earlier too was historically black colleges and universities or hbcus um and the effect that this decision might have in reverse for um students applying to colleges uh and universities who are not um not minorities that's not even really a word that we use much anymore but um black or brown students uh, are the majority at an HBCU. So for students who are seeking admission, um, who are, you know, not um, black or brown, then, uh, you know, what what are the possibilities for um, litigation or, um, you know, issues that, that will arise around students seeking admission who are, who make reverse uh, claims uh, of, you know, of, of failure to, you know, or, or lack of access. You know, I think that, as we discussed a little bit earlier today, I think that historically black colleges actually have been kind of attentive to that and actually have thought about their practices and actually have made some made some changes and modifications just to make sure they're not caught in that kind of situation. So what if a historically selective and historically predominantly white college or university that decided to engage in some exchange programs with historically black college and universities and said, okay, we're going to have semester programs or we're going to have one year exchange programs or, or, or maybe more. We'll see how that goes to contribute to exchanges for the benefit of diversity. Is that really? Uh, there is that. Um, actually, you can. My son is a graduate of North Carolina Central University, which is an HBCU, um, and there are certain they have a relationship with Duke right up the street um, between Central and Duke. There are some Duke students who take classes at Central, and there are some North Carolina Central students that take certain classes at Duke. Um, I don't know in what um, subject areas, but uh, but those relationships exist uh, as far as mutual um priv you know privileges uh campus privileges they have a relationship um and i don't i don't know um if there's a formal exchange i'm not actually sure what they call um those privileges but there are relationships that exist like that yeah when i when i went to college i was part of a small college consortium the great lakes college association and I was at a very conservative college. I don't know how I ended up there, other than the fact I went to high school with 5,000 kids, um, no college counseling. Most kids didn't go to college. 
I just went down a college night program, went to one booth, told them my ACT scores. They said, you get a scholarship. I went home to my dad said, I guess that's where you're going. So I ended up at DePaul University. Um, and it's a very conservative school. And I was felt kind of, I wasn't that comfortable there. And I did an international exchange program with Antioch College in Yellow Springs, Ohio, which is at the far other end of the spectrum. And, um, you know, and my financial aid transferred. Uh, so it's just, a, you know, an open exchange program. So, yeah. So I think, Chuck, that's a great idea to get yeah. diversity to do this kind of exchange programs. The only drawback being is that we know that the degree, the paper, the degree has a lot of value. And there's been a number of studies that look at people graduating from elite colleges and what's their income going to be ultimately. And it makes a difference. Um, so even though you can do the exchange program and you get some advantages of diversity at both institutions, the uh, the, the lesser of the two institutions in terms of national rankings for whatever they're worth, it's not going to, they're not going to graduate with the degree. And I think that, I think, I think that's the trap to say that um, that's sufficient because now we're getting diversity, but those students still aren't getting some of the benefits of the, of the degree. It's a good point. Yeah, that is a really good point. And so you might have to look at things like where if, the exchanges were at the undergraduate level that those who had participated might have that work to their advantage for purposes of graduate school applications or admission. You know, I'm, I love these talks because we could just kind of think out loud. But yes. I suppose well, I think there's one thing that could happen is you have these exchange programs and maybe somebody comes into a, a more elite school and does really well. And so now it's now it's that okay, I'm accepting you because of your great point for the year you were here. Um, so you demonstrated your academic qualifications. You didn't get here on a race-based program. You got here on this exchange program. You weren't admitted on a race-based program, but you were able to show what you can do at our school. And now we're going to admit you on your performance. And I think that might be a way to get or, to, to get around that concern about not getting access to the degree. Well, and I love that because yeah. it gives the opportunity for performance to those who have traditionally and historically been excluded, dishonored, dehumanized, disrespected, underserved. And based on that performance, you're moving it back to a merit-based admissions. And one of the things that schools are doing that recognizes that certain non-academic factors have had somewhat racially disparate impacts, the legacy program. A number of colleges now, including the one where I attended, Carleton, not far from you in Minnesota, is essentially completely discarding their legacy program. Yeah, many schools are. Um... There was an interesting article in the Chronicle on Higher Education in August that looked at the eight Ivy League schools and um, Stanford, University of Chicago, MIT, and Duke. Um, and they looked at their legacy programs. And it turns out that you're five times more likely to get in if you're a legacy to, to those, those elite institutions. And that should be disturbing. That should be disturbing to, to everybody. You know, the other, well, go ahead. You know, I think that that exchange program, okay, so we're going to run the exchange program. We're going to let people come and enter our academic program. It turns out they do really well. I say, okay, um, we're going to admit you to our full-time degree granting program based on your performance. One concern may be that this is not a traditionally um, diverse community at this college, and somebody who is coming from that environment suddenly may feel, really out of place. Um, so I think what you need to do is, uh, again, provide some support for those individuals, um, recognizing they're coming from a different environment. And uh, I think that's part of it. So I, I really think you, this could be a successful approach, but it's gotta be, it's gotta be broad thinking. You, it's not just admit them and let's see, let's see how they do. Um, I think you've gotta pay some attention to what, what their life is like at, at the university. Yeah, yeah. There needs to be, yeah, with that approach, there would certainly need to be support and development. 
and that's a great argument for opening the exchanges beyond just the student level to faculty. And we know there are exchanges among a wide range of universities of faculty, faculty, student guest professorships, sabbaticals, things like that. But administrative and support services, the learning opportunities there really haven't been tapped yet, as far as we can tell. You know, we talk about the elite colleges, you know, we should talk about their endowments. You know, we're talking about endowments of $25 billion, not That's million, it. billion dollars. Yeah. You know, so there is a lot of money there for support and for outreach that, I mean, one thing I think we should do is call out the schools. Say, stop hoarding the money. Stop sitting on it. And why don't you start spending it? Yeah, for access and equity. Yeah, equitable inclusion. So for that to happen, would it be necessary or at least helpful that some kind of collective of higher educational institutional leadership come together and formulate goals, values, objectives that would serve those ends? That'd be wonderful. Yeah, you know, you know, the reality is that college applications are declining. You know, people are questioning whether or not they need to go to college. So I think that if, you, if you're an administrator, you should be thinking creatively, but what can I do to address this decline? And what can I do to perhaps um, expand my pool of applicants? And uh, I've got $25 billion. So, so can I, can't I can I spend this money in ways that will reach populations that we never never reached before? And maybe it's going so far back to start these pathway programs in junior high school, you know, and start giving students kind of support and direction that will put them on a on a college career. So yeah, I think it'd be great if, if leaders got together. It would be great to do that on a broad scale. There are programs that exist uh, for black students in Rhodes. There are programs that have existed for that purpose. And we know that not only the most selective colleges and universities, but many colleges and universities receive more applications from qualified applicants than they have spaces for. And one of the inferences of that is that maybe we are underserving a large sector of our, not just our intentionally excluded and underserved groups, but our otherwise qualified groups that are not getting the kind of learning opportunities that the colleges that don't have space for spaces for them would acknowledge that they deserve, that they earn. Well, yeah, the Students for Fair Admissions case, you know, one of the justifications for that, for that result was that Robert said it's a zero-sum game. You know, every time you admit someone on an affirmative action program, that means somebody else gets excluded. And you know, there are negative effects here. But you got to think about that for a minute. What do you mean it's a zero sum game? Once again, you've got $25 billion. Now, why can't you expand your class? It's not a zero sum game. These aren't fixed amounts by some external requirement. You can do what you want. Um, uh, this whole idea that it's a it's a win loss zero sum game. I just don't think it's defensible. Well, in the zero sum game, connects with the same theory applied to employment, housing, wealth, power, status. It's been the justification. Heather McGee has written a wonderful book called Some of Us, which it studies the history and the applications of that from the exclusive discriminatory swimming pools back in the 60s up to the present. Huh. And these are problems that we're going to need to address, but you're right, they're going to need creative, expansive, collective, collaborative solutions based on solidarity. And diversity is the heart of solidarity. That's right. 
Well, some people in the higher education are, are you know, kind of depressed now. Um, I think it's an exciting time. You know, I think it's, I think that one thing this U.S. Supreme Court decision has done is this kind of snapped people to attention. It's like, you know, what have I been doing? You know, what is the history of my institution? You know, I say in my mission statement, and I believe in fairness and equality, you know, what have I done about it? Um, I think one of the positives is that people are looking much more closely at their own policies and practices and thinking about what they can do to reach a larger audience, to be more accessible, um, to be better. Yep. And former section chair Nancy Welch is right in the middle of it at TCU. And I'm sure there are others as well. Okay, last thoughts to wrap things up, Rebecca. Diversity is a fact, and um, we're better together. Great summer. David? You know, and I'll say something I often say is that um, tell your friends to vote, tell your families to vote, get people out to vote. Um, we want um, unbiased, um, forward thinking legislators. And, uh, you know, if we want to make these pathways easier, Let's get the right people in office. Rebecca Radliff, David Larson, thanks so much for your time, for your thoughts, your perspectives. Think Back Hawaii. Come back and join us. We'll be back again in a couple of weeks. Take care and aloha. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.